because I'm so interesting. Okay, Adam, I will start <laughs> with you. Uh, my name is Anthony Wood. I am an architect. Uh, I, am, I am a professor of architecture, and I lead an organization mm -hmm. called the Council on Tall Buildings and Urban Habitat, which is the worldwide trade association, if you like, for all those who are involved in tall buildings, but increasingly, you know, urban density and future cities around the world. Yeah, fantastic. And we're going to get into tall buildings and where it meets sustainability. So my first question is, can we achieve the the targets, the embodied carbon reduction targets that um, a lot of firms are beginning to set with, with tall buildings? Can it be done? Is it possible? Well, it depends what those targets are, my friend, and they differ mm -hmm. from, from city to city and country to country. But, you know, here's Okay, here's my honest answer on that. That there's, to be frank, there's a lot of bullshit in the industry. Okay, and and a tall building in itself is going to take more energy to operate and more energy, you know, in the in the embodied materials, more embodied energy in the materials than an equivalent number of small buildings, you know, because. Because those materials need to perform at height to a far greater degree environmentally, wind, you know, other 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 factors than small buildings. So, so we need to be clear about this. Tall buildings in themselves, as single objects, are not necessarily going to save the planet um, in terms of their energy profile. But where they really, really come into the fore is about the the benefits of of density of urban density so if you look at the single building in itself we've got to do the best we can in cut in both operating and embodied energy terms but the real benefits are in concentrated land use concentrated infrastructure and basically the creation of the vertical city over the horizontal city which is you know completely unsustainable hmm. fantastic there's a lot in that what is the the role of mass timber? Um, sort of shoehorning that into into this conversation, and how 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 can that um, you know help achieve some sort of embodied carbon reductions? Let alone, I think we're when we're talking really tall buildings, we're probably not going to have a fully you know a full mass timber building potentially at that hundred story range, which we see with concrete and steel buildings. Well, why not? Why not? I mean, you asked me about you know mass that. timber, and 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 um, you know, the reality is that. Mass timber is a total game changer, and if if you if you are looking if you are serious about trying to achieve anywhere near carbon neutrality with tall buildings, now when I say carbon neutrality, I mean as a total carbon equation, not operating energy, but to, you know the, the 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 materials themselves, the embodied energy. The only way that you could ever come anywhere close to that would be to build as much of the building out of mass timber as possible. <laughs> Yeah. And okay. and so mass timber is a game changer in the industry. It is. It's a complete game changer. You know, it's the only material that doesn't require too much energy to produce it. It's quite happily happy producing itself for 20 years as opposed to other materials. But better than that, you know, it actually sequesters carbon out of the atmosphere whilst it's producing itself as a building material for us to use. So, I mean, that's a little simplified. Of course, we do need energy to create mass timber from trees, and but still that energy profile is much uh, lower than, than than steel, concrete, and other materials. So so it's, it's a game changer. I mean, it's a game changer in that we are now farming building products. You know, that's the way that we need to look about it. Of course, it's got to be part of that whole sustainable forestry, planting more trees. But, you know, like any crop, it's a crop. You know, it's a, it's a farm crop. And that's why it's a game changer for tall buildings and the building industry as a whole. Yeah. So what are some of the benefits in of mass timber in the tall building construction? You know, maybe mid-rise and maybe the nuances even as you go higher, higher than that. Well, the benefits are fourfold. You know, the, 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 the first is the, is the sustainable carbon energy benefits, right? So we've talked about that, that the less energy to produce the, the sequestering of carbon out of the atmosphere. So there's number one. Number two is the, the potential speed and, and, and cost efficiency. Yeah, now don't forget, this is, a, this is an industry, a sub-industry, mass timber, which is still relatively in its infancy. Yeah, but, but 
but the potential, you know, to get on top of that and economies of scale and start to reproduce this material, produce this material in a much more efficient way, um, is massive. And then the benefits of its its efficiency on site. Yeah, I mean, it's incredible seeing these. Now, admittedly, you know, in the US, we're probably, I think we're up to about 20 stories. I think Ascent is maybe 18 stories. Um, you know, so we're not super tall yet, but it's incredible to go on these sites and see six people, six people yeah. assembling the whole building, you know. And I think, you know, I, I so, so, so the cost scenario is interesting because you speed up the construction. If you're saving three months, off a 20 story building think what you could save off a you know 60 story building and and the savings are really predominantly about the construction loans i mean if you save six months or 12 months off the construction time it's not only cheaper you know labor labor savings and all the rest of it but but a lot of you know developers go into debt for you know take out loans for this construction so the interest on on, on that is massive. So number one is the energy profile, the carbon profile. Number two is the is the cost and efficiency savings. Number three, massive. I mean, probably the biggest. I should have started with this. Is the human benefits. You know, it's the it's it's, it's the biophilic human benefits. Again, scientifically proven that that people want that connection with natural materials, of which mass timber is a part. Again, scientifically proven that people in these natural environments are happier. Uh, and that and that 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 has direct financial benefit, whether that is able to sell the apartment at a higher price, or you know, I'm an office, um, I'm a business owner, and my 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 um, employees are more productive. So that's the third one. By the way, it's probably more than four, but we'll stop at four. And then the fourth one is what I call the consequent uh, or knock on benefits of 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 this choice of mass timber. For example. You know, mass timber is is light, so the choice of mass timber has a positive knock on effect on other systems in the building. Most most notably, the foundations. You know, I mean, one of my favorite stories with mass timber, the Mjostene, in which is the tallest old timber building in the world in in Norway, has some concrete in the upper floors. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I remember at one of our conferences, someone asking, you know, the owner developer was presenting on this building as it was just being built. The, the world's all, tallest all timber building and some smart alec put his hand up and said yes but there's concrete in the top floors and the owner developer said yeah we had to put some concrete in otherwise the building would have been too light and might have blown away you know i mean it was being facetious but wow. but that concrete's there to to make it a bit heavier and damp it down you know um because timber is so light i mean there's a project in norway that's put 20 maybe not 20, but it's put X number of stories of residential mass timber over an existing shopping mall from the 1960s. Think about that in terms of your carbon equation and, and uh, you know, and, 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 and reinvigorating cities. You've got this crappy old, okay, I better not say that might have been nice, but I don't think so. This shopping mall or a car park from the 1960s, they built like whatever, a dozen stories of residential over the top of it on the existing structure because the mass timber was so light. Mm. Yeah, there's so much in that. I might um, just add one to it. It just popped up as you were saying that. It was, I remember I used to be a concrete engineer and used to look forward to 80-story buildings because you just design one floor and then it'd be a repeat, repeat floor for the whole, you know, the whole way. And I feel like that um, is much greater and much bigger deal in off-site construction is the idea of repeatability of typical floors because the first level and you know when we speak to people on the podcast here it's always the first level where you you're sort of learning and you're figuring things out the second and then you you know you really start hitting speed on level three four and five then if the, the job stops whereas for high-rise buildings you're just going on and on and on and then the speed of construction can probably reach new levels what, what are your thoughts on that yeah, absolutely. And I mean, it's interesting that you pick up on the floors because actually the floors are where it where it's at. And, you know, a, a few moments ago, I kind of implied that we could be building 100 story buildings out of timber. And um, and the reason I say that, I mean, really, the timber, the, the, the biggest drawback to timber. Yeah. The biggest drawback to timber is the is the cross dimensional area to achieve the structural you know structural capacity of the, of the member you know it's it's not that timber's not strong enough and the, even the fire uh, you know i believe that we, we we've resolved that 
But but the reality is that the cross section of timber that you would need to achieve the same structural aim as in steel is going to be bigger. And then you've often got a sacrificial char layer on the outside of it. So you lose floor area. And if you were going up 100 stories, you know, that 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 that, that, that has an impact. So so maybe the sensible solutions in the future is that we stick to concrete or steel or composite construction for the vertical dimension. But but the point I'm making here is you take a tall building, 80 percent of the weight of that building's in the floors. It's not in yeah. the columns not in the bracing it's in the floors so if we just switch from concrete to timber mass timber for the floors we can reduce the you know over 40 50 60 100 stories then we can reduce the weight of that building very very significantly yeah 100 percent. that's so good you might have already mentioned a few but can you mention some of the the most interesting and innovative mass timber buildings that you've seen in recent years moving into this space yeah, sure. Yeah. Well, you know, okay. All right. I'll perhaps surprise you um, by saying that a lot of these buildings are not that innovative at the minute. You know, I, I mean, especially here in America, you wouldn't even know they're frigging mass timber buildings because, of course, they're covered up, you know, they're, they're covered up and, um, you know, all encapsulated. So, you know, it's a shame, really, but, but you, you have this beautiful material and because of, you know, anxieties over the fire code, they're often encapsulated in, in, in gypsum and uh, and from the outside, you wouldn't necessarily know, you know, just 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 standard rectilinear towers. So it is a little disappointing to me how um, the p real potential of mass timber is not yet being delivered. But there are projects I think that 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 do start to get to that uh, potential. So um, you know, I've mentioned Mjolnir in Norway. I think it's an incredible building. Um, it's totally mass timber. I mean, mass timber cores. Um, mass timber bracing, mass timber facade. I mean, that was interesting. That same conference where the smart Alex says, "Hey, you got concrete in the floors." Someone has asked, "Well, how can how can you clad this thing in in timber? It's twenty stories, twenty plus stories. How can you clad it in timber?" And 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 the, and the Norwegian guy says, "We got stave churches that have been around for a thousand years, you know, in timber." It's, you know, I think everyone thinks you've got to get up there every five years with a bucket of creosote, you know, and kind of paint this timber to, to protect it. And it's just not the case at all, you know. I mean, he said, we do have to get up after 20 years, but that's to ensure that the, the fire retardant aspect of the timber, the impregnations are still working rather than, you know, timber's not a very, um, you, you, you know, kind of, it's a maintenance heavy material. So I think Yostanet is an incredible project. Um, you know, I think this project at Carol Dorman that I talked about in in in, in Holland is um, incredible. This this vertical extension over an existing six story shopping mall. You know, the Sara Kunta House in Sweden, um, it, uh, uh, white architecture building is it is is just beautiful. It's beautiful, and it, it, it it's a hybrid building, steel timber. You know, because they've got this huge conference center at the bottom, so it's a wide span plate space. And a, a, a building, and then a, a, a you know it's a, a vertical building. So that so so for example, they've got these trusses um, in in the in the wide span place. I know you've seen them, but they're beautiful because they've got the timber in acting in compression with steel rods and in, in, in tension. And it's just that's how to do it. Let the material you know be where it wants to be in terms of its performance. Um, you got a project going on there in in Australia, which I think is is in, I don't know what stage it it's at at Atlassian. Um, so I was happy to sit here you say that it's um it's a it's a ripper. It's uh, rip is a term in Australia for something we say really it's really awesome. But yeah, yeah, forty stories like it's got a steel exoskeleton and essentially four stories of mass timber buildings stacked up on top of each other with a concrete transfer deck. So it's a really interesting way of managing yeah. the fire, separating the fire, and you can have a bit of exposed in between. So it's really it's a high rise building with a fair bit of exposed timber and it's quite a brilliant design um but it's awesome yeah 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 and yeah. uh, well there you go all three materials kind of working in um in symbiosis which is great so you know i think that shop architects uh out in new york that designed that so we're excited about that seeing that and the diagram and everything coming together um yeah I, you know there's four Let, let's yeah. stop there i'll be going all day i'd imagine like once you see a few go up 
Um, and it's it's like, oh, you know, who's, who, who did the the Fosbury flop? I'm thinking they just shoot from the hip a little bit here, but, you know, Dick Fosbury and whatever Olympics it was with the high jump, everyone's jumping face first in the high jump and the first person does the Fosbury flop. Then a year later, everyone's doing the flop because they figure out it's possible. So, you know, maybe as soon as we see a high-rise application, then all of a sudden it it ex- expands exponentially in, in a simil- similar way, hey? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, and I, I think that's what's happening. I mean, in the US, we've got some supply problems, you know. I mean, you know, it's ironic because... Um, I mean, you know, I'm from England originally. We build our house out of brick and block. You know, we have done for, for several hundred years. But here in America, a lot of the buildings for, for, for 200 years have been built out of stick frame timber construction. Um, and yet that switch to mass timber has been two, three decades behind Europe um, and other places. So, so they're kind of struggling to catch up, really, in terms of supply, trying to meet demand. Um, you know, for multi-story, for mass timber for multi-story buildings. Um, but it definitely is gathering pace here. Um, and, uh, you know, but but again, I, you know, and the code's catching up, you know, we're starting to see the code support now, um, you know, a, a bit more use of the material of the systems. Um, you know, one thing that worries me, though, you know, if there ever was a... Um, you know, God forbid, but if there if there ever was a fire, now fires happen in tall buildings, fires happen in buildings all the time, yeah? Um, and, and I'll be honest with you, you know, if, if, if you're ever in a city and there's any kind of natural disaster, earthquakes or other things, you want to head into the modern design tall building. You know, when you, when you get a lot of disasters, um, the tall buildings are the ones modern designed. You know, look at what's just happened in Turkey. Those aren't tall mm. buildings that that the, the kind of ten ten up to ten story shoddily built concrete buildings that 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 are killing people. Um, but fire is a different issue, and and so you know it's kind of perception. You know, I mean, I talk about you know maybe you're too young to remember the towering inferno. You know, the towering inferno did for high rise buildings what what jaws did for sharks. You know, it's like <laughs> I mean, I'm 53 now, and I'm still shit scared of going in the sea because I watched Jaws as a 10 year old or 8 year old and it like terrified me and I still remember the towering inferno so you know and, and in all seriousness you know look at what happened with Grenfell I mean by the way Grenfell mm. Tower in London the Grenfell Tower fire set back mass timber in the UK by maybe 10 years and there wasn't an ounce of timber in that building it had mm. nothing to do with timber, but it suddenly is projected into the public conscience. This fear, this, 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 you know, issues of uh, uh, that are raised that should never be raised because that building didn't perform. You know, it was inflammable cladding on the outside and it just whipped up the tower. But then suddenly people make the assumption well, if we're building buildings out of flammable material, what gets more flammable than timber? And so we'd only need one of those. Um, you know, tragedies to happen in the mass timber world could even be a building under construction, it not even occupied, which is the biggest fit risk, of course. You know, while it's yes. under construction, and and that could really set the industry back. Possibly could not even recover if there was loss of life, and you know, because there's a lot of naysayers in this industry, and a lot of people that are saying we should not be building buildings out of mass timber. We have not faced the fire challenge, and 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 if that did happen. You know, they'd be the first out of the, you know, from a pop up above the parapet to say, we told you so. Yeah. Well, on, on Grenfell Tower, I believe it was no sprinklers either. So it was just like a lot of the things you'd have in mass timber buildings, not there. And, you know, I'm, I'm sure what you're saying is like, we're, we're all saying who are advocates of mass timber. It's not just be cowboys and just don't care about fire. It's more like have a reasonable, like you do for any structural engineering, you're not making it zero risk. It's like not making your speed limits five kilometers an hour and driving around with three feet of steel, protecting everybody. It's like, what is a reasonable level of risk? You know, bearing in mind that we're trying to design sustainably and and improve the industry going forward as well. Um yeah. So the, the, the other thing that's interesting about that, Adam, actually, it, you know, is post fire, you know, post fire, after fire. I mean, most buildings, when they've under 
you know, experience trauma in that way. They're completely unoccupied, unoccupiable, that they're structurally compromised and, you know, and, and, and there's no alternative but to, you know, after an earthquake or whatever, or if you break fire, the building comes down. But timber also has another potential because timber has a lot more flexibility to replace actual elements of it. It's a lot easier to cut out a timber or replace a timber column or a shear wall um, than it is, you know, with steel and concrete. Um, and again, I, you know, I like my stories, but a, a few months, a few months ago, we had a, we got a lot of funding from the industry for various projects here at CG Bridge, but one of them is we got a, this project funded by both the timber industry and the steel industry on steel timber hybrids. And we cool. had this conference a few months ago and all the world experts came and spoke, but, um, uh, we had Andrew Wall out of London come and talk about a project he'd done in London. It was timber steel in, uh, hybrid, but it was mostly timber. And then um, after about four or five years, the tenant or the client for the building changed and it actually turned into a school of architecture. And they decided that they needed a new stair in a position where there was not a stair. Now you think about it, say a 10 story building, mm -hmm. how difficult would it be with concrete floor and all the rest of it to put a stair they put it in in the weekend. I mean, they cut they cut out the floor plate, the timber, hmm. yeah, and then they use that timber in the in the intermediate, you know, landings, and they and they just winched it up, and they put in this stair in almost a weekend. You know, cut it out this lab and put it in, and and there's just there's a great flexibility about uh, mass timber as well. Yeah, that's so good. So what what do you see is a sort of a blue sky where things are going? in the future of our cities, you know, not necessarily just mass timber, but it, but it could be considering all the new technological advancements, offsite construction and modern methods of construction or, you know, anything that's happening, where do you see everything going? <laughs> that's a big <laughs> question to finish with. And then, you know, okay, all right, all right. Okay, well, I'll, I'll try and give you a quick potted answer. You know, I mean, we spoke a lot about mass timber, we spoke a lot about tall buildings. I mean, actually, when I'm at my most hypercritical, I'm, I'm pretty critical about tall buildings. I think, you know, most tall buildings around the world tend to be either just completely commercial boxes or gratuitous forms of sculpture. You know, like, I want an icon and I look like this. You know, it's like, and, and that, that denies sometimes hundreds, if not thousands of years of vernacular tradition. And I believe that we need to be looking for local responses for, for all buildings, but tall buildings as well. I believe there is an Australian tall building, an African tall building, an American tall building, and they're not all the same, whereas in the minute they're all designed to a global palette. So so, so I, I think that the industry needs to head towards, you know, far more thought going into what generates these buildings and how they perform. And so the kind of things that I'm seeing happening and, and, encourage, and we're encouraging at the council is not only the use of mass timber and, and, and advanced technologies, but sky gardens, sky bridges, green walls. I mean, I, you know, every mm. single tall building that's built from tomorrow onward should have public accessible space at the top of the building, preferably the roof, which is open, best views, cleanest environment, plantable, you know, with trees yeah. and vegetation and all the rest of it. So we're starting to see this. I mean, I did my PhD on sky bridges. Um, 20 years ago and uh, you know at that point we only had patrol oh. and everyone thought I was crazy well there are 100 buildings now multiple mm. complexes of tall buildings linked at several levels you know bringing the horizontal up into the vertical so you know it, it, short answer to your question I don't think it's so much technologies that are going to change cities I think it's our approach to buildings and and trying to achieve a more three-dimensional urban configuration if you like rather than just you know urban planning tends to be just a two-dimensional plan with heights stipulated but we need to think about the whole three dimensions and how we can maximize that yeah awesome well it's been so good speaking to you today anthony if people want to find out more about yourself and the things we've been speaking about today where where should we point them very easy www.ctbuh.org that's Council on Tall Buildings and Urban Habitat.org.